I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, and we're going to be in verse 13 today as we continue through the text together, going through the book of 1 Peter as a church. Peter's written us about how to have joy in the midst of trial and suffering, and in the last six verses, he's talked about this, and I want you to hear this as a reminder, for the last six verses, he's talked about how amazing our salvation is. He's talked about how our salvation, our our genuine faith in Christ is more valuable than gold because at the day of the revelation of Christ, it's going to result in praise and honor and glory. He's reminded us that our salvation is amazing because the prophets of old longed to experience what you experienced but didn't get to. He's reminded us that our salvation is amazing because the angels long to experience but they never will. And so for six verses, he's describing how unbelievable it is that you and I are saved. But then in verse 13, his language changes. He starts speaking in the imperative, which is a fancy way of saying, okay, in light of this amazing salvation, here's what you need to do. In light of your salvation, here is your and my response, and what he's going to show us is that if you've been forgiven through Jesus Christ, if your sins are forgiven, I want you to hear this, if your sins have been forgiven, you are free from condemnation, but if your sins have been forgiven, you are not free from obligation, and that our salvation demands from you and I a response, and at the end of the day, church, that makes all the sense in the world. Because what did Jesus do in order to purchase our forgiveness of our sins? What did he do? He died, right? He died. He shed his blood on a cross so that you and I could be forgiven. And since he died for you, should your response and my response not be to live differently for him? Let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. There's a a movie that came out about 20 years ago. It was called Saving Private Ryan. And um, I, I'm about to ruin the end of the movie for you if you've never seen it, but I'm too bad at, you've had 20 years. And so I apologize for that. Um, so the movie's about this private. It was one of four brothers. All of them were in the military during World War II. Three of them died. So the United States Army sends in um, a squad of Army Rangers to find this Private Ryan and save him, bring him home to his mother, because she's the last, he was the last living son, and through the course of finding him, it's like finding a needle in a haystack, several of the rangers lost their lives, and the captain that was ultimately in charge of the expedition gave up his life, so this saving private Ryan, this, this private Ryan could make it out. The movie begins where, you don't realize it at the time, but it's private Ryan, and it's 50 years later, he's an old man. And he's at the cemetery there on Normandy where this captain was buried. He sees the headstone of the captain that gave his life for him. He, he runs to it and falls down, collapses in front of the grave. Begins to weep bitterly. His wife runs to him, puts her hand on him and says, are you okay? And he looks up at her, tears streaming down his face. And he asks her the question, am I a good man? And she said, of course you're a good man. And then he asked her the question, have I lived a good life? And she said, yes, you have. And church, why was the old man asking those questions? Am I a good man? Have I lived a good life? I think he asked those questions because it hit him in that moment that this guy that was laying in his grave gave up 50 years of his life so that he could have 50 more years of life. It hit him in that moment that this guy laying in the ground gave up a wife and kids and grandkids so that he could have a wife and kids and grandkids. And when that reality hit him, the the question that came screaming out of his heart was, have I lived a life that was worthy of the sacrifice that was made for me? And that's exactly what Peter's doing here in this text. He's reminding us, that we have a Savior that died for us. Look, not that we can have 50 more years of life, but you and I have a Savior that died for us so that you and I could have eternal life. And so how much more before that eternal life begins should we be asking the question, am I a good man? Am I a good woman? Am I living the life 
Not for the purpose of morality, but am I living a life that is worthy of the sacrifice that was made for me by Jesus Christ? And so let's read this together. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Peter says, therefore. In other words, over the last six verses, he's been saying, your, your salvation's amazing. Your salvation's amazing. It's unbelievable. He goes, therefore. Here's what we're going to do. He says, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. And after six, six verses of saying how amazing your salvation is, he stops and he says, this is your response, this is your obligation, you're to be holy in all your behavior. Now, if you didn't grow up in church or you're new to the church thing, that word holy is kind of a church word. You don't hear it much outside of the church. And so I want to give you a definition of what holy means because Peter's saying this is our response to our salvation. Holiness, the definition of holiness means to be set apart for one singular purpose. If you look at the original language, that's what it means. It means to be set apart for a single purpose in your life. And so church, to be holy means to be different than the world. To be holy means that you, you act different than the world. It means you think different than the world. It means you respond different than the world. To be holy means you're set apart for a singular purpose of glorifying and worshiping and serving the Lord. Okay? Now, what Peter's showing us here today, one, is that holiness is the obligation of our salvation. But check this out. The other thing he's showing us is that holiness is going to be the evidence of your salvation. Holiness is going to be the inevitable result of the fact that you are saved. Let me show you what I mean by that. Um, when, I, when I first interviewed with the pastor search team to be you guys pastor here at Sagemont, one of the things that they did not tell me was how many hurricanes you people have in the city. I'm from Austin. We didn't ever pay attention to hurricanes. We vaguely knew they happened. But I got here, and I've been through a couple of them. They were mild, but there's a lot of hurricanes in this place. I didn't know that. Now, for the sake of my illustration today, I want you to imagine that next weekend, after Thanksgiving, there's a Category 5 monster hurricane that's going to hit the city of Houston. And, and you think, well, that couldn't happen. It's 2020. It could happen, people, all right? And so just imagine, hang with me, we've got this major hurricane, Category 5. It's hitting us next weekend but we decided, even though the brunt of it's going to hit Sunday morning, we decided we're godly people. We're coming to church, for crying out loud. We're going to do it. Even in the midst of a Category 5 hurricane, we're coming. But on the way to church, as I'm, as I'm coming out there, going through a Category 5 hurricane, my truck breaks down about a mile away. Now, that would never happen because I drive a Tundra. But anyway, that's a, not for another <laughs> sermon another day. But sake of my argument... I break down, Category 5 hurricane, truck breaks down a, a, about a mile away, and so I have to walk the last mile to get to church through a Category 5 hurricane. Now, when I step up on the stage, because I just get here in time to preach, and I walk up on the stage, and I come up and I say, guys, I'm sorry I'm late, I just walked through a mile in a Category 5 hurricane. But as I said that, you looked, and my hair was still perfect. I'm not... That sounded bad. My hair looked, looked good, right? My hair is not perfect, but my hair looked good. You know, it wasn't blown around or anything. And then you look at my sports jacket, and it was dry. And you looked at my pants, and they're dry, and my shoes were not wet at all. Here's the question. Would you believe me that I just walked a mile through a Category 5 hurricane? Well, no, you wouldn't. Why? Because if you walk through a Category 5 hurricane, there's going to be evidence. You're going to be affected. And here's my point today, that the power of a Category 5 hurricane is nothing compared to the power of the cross and the power of the resurrection of Jesus. And if you've experienced the power of the cross in your life, if you've experienced the power of the resurrection in your life, there's going to be evidence. 
it's going to be obvious that you've experienced something, and what Peter's saying here is that the evidence that you have walked through the Category 5 hurricane of the cross is holiness. That's going to be the evidence, all of you holiness. Now, here's another question for you. If holiness is the obligation of our salvation and it's the evidence of our salvation, how holy are we supposed to be? That's an important question. How holy are we supposed to be? Well, let's read this together. 1 Peter 1, 14. He says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, watch what he says. Peter says, Be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Now, wow, Peter. He says that our response to this great salvation is we're to be holy, but then he says we're to be holy in all our behavior, that we're to look at all of our lives as set apart for the singular purpose of glorifying God. That means that we do crazy stuff like we look at our words and our language as holy. That we don't watch our speech and keep our speech pure just because we're moral people, but we do it because even our mouths are set apart for the singular purpose of glorifying God. Young folks, it means in your dating relationships that you even look at your dating relationships as holy. It means you, it ought to change the way you physically interact with each other. It ought to change when and how and where you spend time together. Not because you're just supposed to be a good kid, but because you have been saved and you've been set apart for the singular purpose of glorifying God in your life. It means that that ought to change our marriage. We're going to look at our marriage as holy. It changes the way we talk to our spouse. It changes the way we serve our spouse. It changes the way we forgive our spouse. Why? Because our marriage is holy and is two holy people in a marriage. It ought to completely change the way we interact and be set apart for the singular purpose of glorifying God. It ought to change the way we deal with our finances, the way we view money, the way we spend money, because we realize that God has given us everything we have. And so when we realize that that we are people that are holy and that we're called to be set apart, we'll even start looking at our finances as something set apart for the singular purpose of glorifying God. It changes everything. Peter says, we are, this is the response, that we're going to be holy in all our behavior. But, check this out, some of you are like me, and you hear that that word holy, and and you start getting a little uncomfortable, amen? You, you, You hear the word all, and you get real uncomfortable. That we're to be holy in all our behavior, and like, wait a minute, Peter, that's that's pretty intense. So, back in the day, we used to sing a song in church called I Surrender All. Y'all, anybody remember that song? I Surrender All. Been around church long enough. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. And I remember singing that song and being a little uncomfortable because deep down inside, what I really meant was I surrender some. (laughs) And And then on like really good days, I'd still be uncomfortable because what I meant was I surrender most, right? And then I'm like, even I'd be uncomfortable on really, really good days, like awesome days. I'm walking with Jesus, crushing it with Jesus because it would be more like I surrender all but that one thing, you know. But that's the call. That's the call. Jesus left the glory of heaven. He left the comfort of the glory of heaven and he put on our flesh and he spent 33 years walking around in our injured flesh and he was crucified on a Roman cross. He had nails pierced his hands and his feet. He had a crown of thorns that was crushed in his head. He was beaten and then he died after hanging there for six hours. And I think Peter's saying, hey, in light of the sacrifice that was made for you, this is our response. We're to set our lives apart, all our behavior, for the single purpose of worshiping him and serving him. Now, here's what I'm thankful for, guys, is that Peter doesn't just say that to you. He doesn't say, hey, be holy in all your behavior. And then just drop the mic and take off. He actually tells us how to do it. Some things to think about. 
and how to live a life of holiness. So look at verse 14 together. Go ahead and turn there. 1 Peter 1, 14. But here's what I want to do. I want to give you the first thing Peter is going to show us. He's going to give us step one on how we can live this life of obedience and holiness. And this is key here. Number one, step number one is remember that holiness is not just your response, it's your identity. This is key here. Remember that holiness is not just something you do, but if you're saved, it's now who you are. Let me talk about that as a minute. Let's look at the text, 1 Peter 1.14. Peter says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which, yours, which were yours in his ignorance. So he's writing the church. He's not writing lost people. He's writing people that are believers. And he says, as obedient children. Now look at that phrase. Because when you look at the original language, what Peter, he's really not saying as obedient children. What he's really saying, listen, is as children of obedience. There's actually a big difference between as obedient children and as children of obedience. There's a big difference between the two. In other words, he's not calling us children and then saying that, um, and then using the adjective obedient to describe us. But what Peter is doing is he calls us the children of obedience, which is not an adjective, church, it's a noun. In other words, what he's doing is he's saying this, holiness, is not just something you go try to do, but holy is now something you are. When you got saved, all your sins were forgiven, and you are now a child of obedience. It's your identity. Listen, it's your new nature. It's who you are. Now, this is really key. This is huge. Like, this is a big thing that I learned about 10 years ago in my life. He's saying this is your new identity. As a, as a Christian, it's who you are as a child of obedience. It's your new identity. What that means is that you don't obey God in order to be holy, but he's saying you are holy, therefore go obey God. You see the difference? Did y'all catch that? That's huge. You don't walk out the doors and go, I'm going to try real hard to be holy and obey God in order to be holy. He's saying it's now your new identity. You are a child of obedience, so no, now go live it out. Go live out what you already are. He's telling them what our identity is. He's telling us what our identity is. And it's important because the Bible says that there are only two kinds of people in the world. Two kinds of people in the world. Two kinds of identities. You've got sons of disobedience that Paul talks about in Colossians. And you've got the children of obedience that Peter talks about here. You are one of the two. There's no third option. And so what Peter is showing us here is that we now are children of obedience. We're going to live in holiness. It's going to be the inevitable result. And one of the ways that you can know that you're a child of obedience versus a son of disobedience is do you see a pattern of holiness in your life? That's how you know. My son of disobedience, my child of obedience, how do you know? Do I see a pattern of holiness in my life? Now let me read this to you. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. 1 John 3, 9. Let me read this to you. I want you to look closely at the first part of the sentence. How you can know whether or not you're a child of obedience. In 1 John 3, 9, he says, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Now, that born of God means saved. So he says that no one who's saved, nobody that's received salvation, nobody that's born of God makes a practice of sinning. Now notice, guys, what he doesn't say. Notice there that he doesn't say, that if you're born of God, you're never going to sin. He doesn't say if you're saved, you're never going to sin. He says if you're born of God, you're not going to make a practice of sinning. And what that means is that if you're a Christian, there's going to be times in your life when you sin. But if you are truly a believer, you will never keep on sinning. It's a big difference in the two. Now why? He tells us. First John. 3 9, he says, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Why? He says, For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning. 
John says the reason as a believer that you can sin, but you can't continue to sin, is because God's seed abides in you. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in you, and because of the Holy Spirit, you cannot continue in sin. And so here's what we've learned so far, guys. Hang with me. At the moment of your salvation, you received a brand new nature. I want you to listen. This is huge because we're going somewhere with this. And at the moment of your salvation, you received a brand new nature. You became a child of obedience. Then we also learn here that at the moment of our salvation, we received the Holy Spirit. Now. What do you think is the greatest desire of your new nature? What do you think is the greatest desire of the Holy Spirit that now lives in you? I'm going to talk about this more in a minute, and that's critical. The number one desire of your new nature and the number one desire of the Holy Spirit that now lives in you is holiness. Have you ever wondered why they call the Holy Spirit The Holy Spirit is because he loves holiness. Sin grieves him, and he now lives inside of you if you're saved. And so, here's the thing. When you sin as a child of obedience that now has the Holy Spirit, new nature, and the Holy Spirit inside of you, when you sin, what happens is that the Holy Spirit will start whispering to you because when you sin, it grieves him. He's the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. He abides in you. And so when you sin, when you walk in sin, that grieves the Holy Spirit inside of you. And he starts whispering to you, that is not who you are. You're a child of obedience. You weren't created for that. And typically you'll stop sinning. Now if you're anything like me, sometimes you hear the whisper of the Spirit and you just plow on through it and you keep sinning. And so what the Holy Spirit will do is he'll start yelling at you. Stop! (laughs) You're grieving me. This is not who you are. It's not your identity. You have a new nature. This ain't it. Stop. And you'll hear the call of the Spirit, and you'll stop sinning. And then if you're anything like me, sometimes you keep on going, then the discipline of the Lord comes into your life and makes you stop. But that's a sermon for a different day. But the point is this, is because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you cannot continue in sin. As a believer, guys, I am very capable of sinning, but what I've personally found is that I am completely incapable of continuing in my sin because of the Holy Spirit inside of me, okay? Now, that's what he's saying. He's saying you're a new creation, you have the Holy Spirit, and so you will not continue in sin. Obedience is now your identity. It's going to be a part of who you are. Now, he continues. Look at verse 14. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust, which were yours in your ignorance. So he says, new nature here. New nature, you're a, you're a child of obedience. And so he says, do not be conformed to your former lust, which were yours in your ignorance. There's another translation there of 1 Peter 1.14, and I want you to check it out here. It says, as obedient children... Do not be directed by your former passions. So again, he's teaching us how do we walk in holiness. He says you've got a new identity, and then he says don't be directed by your old passions. What's he talking about, church? He's talking about the evil desires that we had before Jesus. He's talking about the the lust, the desires, the evil desires we had before the Lord. And so here's the implication of this verse, is that even though we're new Creatures, we have the Holy Spirit. At times, we can still be directed and conformed to the evil desires that we had before we were saved. And that was kind of a shock to me when I first got saved. Because I thought that the moment of my salvation, God would completely take away all my evil desires. I really thought that was going to happen. But he didn't. Now, sometimes he does. I talked to a guy the other day that was an alcoholic for years before he got saved He said, Matt, in the moment of my salvation, he said, I got saved, I trusted in Christ. He said, literally in that moment, the Lord took away every desire I ever had to drink, and I've never touched the stuff since. He said, so sometimes God will remove your evil desires, sometimes he won't. 
And even though you're a believer that cannot continue in sin, you'll still have them. Now, guys, if you don't believe me that you still can be conformed by evil desires in your life, I want to talk about one of them that a lot of us are still conformed to and are directed by, and it's called gluttony. You know what gluttony is? Gluttony is when you overeat, intentionally you overeat, and it's in the Bible, and it's actually kind of a big deal. It's like you, you eat more than you should. I had a guy get mad at me in the first service. He goes, man, why you got to talk about gluttony right before Thanksgiving? And I'm like, I didn't, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> Overeating's a sin. It's a, it's a big deal. It's one of the seven deadly sins. We don't talk about it in church, but we do it. And if you don't believe me, think about this. Um, on the day that you, let's say for, on the day you became a Christian and you received the Holy Spirit and became a child of obedience, you went to a fancy steakhouse, did you still have a desire to throw down on a double chocolate fudge sundae after you ate a half a loaf of bread, a garlic bread, and two starters and a T-bone steak, right? Maybe I'm the only one. Like, I, I sometimes do. It's because even though we have the spirit, at times we are directed by these evil desires. Anger, I've been angry. Ever dealt with covetousness? You ever dealt with lust? We are still able to be conformed to these evil desires before we were saved. And so here's the question. How do we, how do we not be conformed to them? How do we not be directed by our evil desires? Well, guys, here's the thing. First thing you got to do is you have to recognize what those evil desires are. That's like the first step, is you got to be honest with yourself and realize, okay, I still have desires that I'm sometimes conformed to. You go, I, I have those. Now, what are they? you got to recognize what they are before you can do what I'm going to teach you next. And for some people, that's easier than others. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. story I'm pretty familiar with in the Bible, y'all are too, it's the story of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son has two brothers in it. And there's really two prodigal sons in the story of the prodigal son. Um, one of our pastors been teaching on it on Wednesday night. You have the younger brother, and the younger brother had a sin pattern that was really obvious. They were very external. They were easy to see. The guy came to his father and said, I wish you were dead, and took his inheritance and went to a faraway land, squandered his inheritance on prostitutes. And so younger, the younger brother had these really obvious external sins, but you have an, another brother who was an older brother, and Jesus showed us in that story that he has just as big a sin problem as the younger brother. But the problem is that the older brother didn't realize he was a sinner. He struggled realizing his sin because his sins were on the inside. It's stuff that's easier to hide. Stuff like self-righteousness and pride and entitlement. And he was angry, he just didn't show it as much. He kind of kept it inside. It was more passive-aggressive. Okay? Now... One of the things I'm realizing in my life is that everybody sort of has a tendency to lean towards one of the two brothers. Be a good subject to talk about at lunch. You a younger brother type or are you an older brother type? I'm kind of a younger brother type. I'm totally capable of sin, and when I sin, I sin, right? And younger brother types, they're the ones, again, the sin is easy. It's external. Um, these are folks that deal with, like, um, sexual sin or lying or foul language or addiction or, or stuff like that. But you got to be careful because younger brothers can have external sin that aren't those crazy foul ones. You know, you, 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 you maybe don't uh, watch rated R movies. You know, you don't drink, you don't chew, you don't go with girls that do, but, you, but you're mean as a rattlesnake. It's gossip. It can cause division. You know, those are younger brother type things. External sin, they're very easy to see. But, but, but the other type of person is an older brother. And, and you're the type of person that, that you have a harder time recognizing your evil desires because they're so much more internal, they're inside, they're so much less obvious. As a matter of fact, I guarantee you, I bet the farm, there's some of you in the room right now that are like, Matt, I don't know what you're talking about, I have no evil desires. <laughs> I know you, the younger brothers just laughed. You're an older brother, you're like, nah, I'm good. I, I, got, I, I got nothing. So let me help you out here. I'm not trying to dog on you because we all got issues. But if you're an older brother and that's what you're thinking right now, you got no evil desires, here's your, your, your evil desire. It's called self-righteousness. It's called pride. And Jesus had a 
big problem with both of those. So we're all on a level playing field here. But I hear, I'm almost done, guys. So here's, here's, hang with me. Here's the point. We all have evil desires. We all have passions. We have a tendency to be conformed to even after our salvation. So step one is be honest with what they are. Recognize them. Then once we recognize what they are, if we see that thing bubbling up in us. Everybody listen, don't miss this. This is huge. When you see that thing bubbling up in you, step number two, first is realize your identity. Step number two is to redirect those passions. Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean? What did I tell you was the greatest desire of your new nature? It's holiness. The greatest passion of the Holy Spirit in you is holiness. And so if you're cruising along, this, this is so big. This has been so big for me, what I'm about to tell you. If you don't hear anything, hear this. It's when you're cruising along and you get in a situation and you sense that evil desire coming up inside of you. It's pornography, it's lust, it's anger, it's self-righteousness, gossip, whatever. And it rises up and you recognize it. And the Holy Spirit starts speaking to you and saying, that's not who you are. Listen, in that moment, you have a choice. You can choose to satisfy the evil desires of your old nature. Or in that moment, you can choose to satisfy the desires of your new nature. One of your natures is getting satisfied. One of, the, one of your nature's desires in that moment is getting fulfilled. It's huge. And so one of the key things I've learned about walking in holiness is to remember that in that moment, in that moment that I choose holiness over the desires of my flesh, I'm not just denying, I'm not just denying the passions of my old nature, but I'm satisfying the passions of my new nature, which loves more than anything to glorify God. And there is a joy, and there is a peace, and there is a satisfaction when I satisfy the desires of my new nature that it blows away anything I could ever experience when I satisfy the desires of my flesh. The desire rises up. You have a choice. Which nature do I satisfy? And I choose to satisfy the greatest desire of my new nature, which is holiness. And happiness is always found here. We have a misconception in our lives that Holiness is the opposite of happiness. We, we have bought the lie that if we choose holiness that we're somehow missing out on life's best. But the Bible is screaming from the rooftops that the greatest experience of happiness is not found in satisfying the desires of our flesh. But when we satisfy the desires of our spirit. And the spirit rejoices and says well done. And a peace and a joy comes over. And it's always better. I listened to a podcast this week. It's about a young man that was struggling with same-sex attraction. He was a Christian. Because he was a follower of Jesus, he made the decision, I'm not going to be directed by the former lusts, my former lusts, which were mine and my ignorance. He made the decision that I'm going to satisfy the desires of the spirit, my new nature that now lives in me, and I'm going to live a life of sexual purity for the rest of my life. And the guy that was interviewing him looked at him and said, you mean to tell me that you struggle with same-sex attraction, but you're never going to act on it? That you're going to remain single the rest of your life and live a life committed to Jesus? And the young man said, yes, I am. And the interviewer said, why? Asked him why. And what the young man said was simple, but it's profound. After a long pause, after the guy said, you mean to tell me you're going to live a life of abstinence and you're going to honor Jesus the rest of your life, even if that means staying single, why are you going to do that? And the young man paused and he looked up and said, because Jesus is better. Because Jesus is better. This young man was not able to walk in holiness because he had this incredible willpower. He was able to walk in holiness because he discovered one of the greatest truths you'll ever discover. When you satisfy the spirit, it's always better. 
when you choose Jesus, it's always better than anything the world has to offer. So I wonder today in light of everything we've learned here, if just like the guy in the, the old guy in the movie who knelt crying at the grave of the man who gave his life for him and asked the question, am I a good man? Am I living a life worthy of the sacrifice that was made for me? I wonder, wonder how many of us church, maybe you've been going to church a long time and you're a believer, but maybe it's time that today you went back to the place where your Savior died for you. Go back to the cross. Go back to the empty tomb. And with tears in your eyes, hit your knees and look up and ask that same question, am I a good man? Am I a good woman? Am I living a life worthy of the sacrifice that was made for me?